Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast, the place for first-gen students of color to prepare for grad school. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Bu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into and successfully navigate grad school. For over 10 years, I've been helping first-gen students of color get into top grad programs in their field, and I'm really excited to support you on your academic journey too. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. This is your host, Doctora Yvette, and today we have a really fun and insightful episode all about how BIPOC women and LGBTQ plus gente can self-care themselves to financial independence. Our guest is Rita Soledad Fernandez Paulino, a queer Mexican-American former math teacher turned personal finance educator and financial coach studying to become a certified financial planner. As the CEO of Wealth Para Todos LLC, Soledad is determined to make sure more BIPOC, women and LGBTQ plus folks learn how to self-care themselves to financial independence so they can work because they want to, not because they have to. Oh, that sounds so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Soledad. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for coming. I would love, love, love to hear more about you, about, you know, who you are, what you do, and Especially, I would love to hear a little more about your backstory and kind of how you got to where you are today. Well, September 30th, 1986, I was born. I was born to my parents who immigrated here from Mexico when they were kids. And I grew up, by, by the time that they were four, they had gotten divorced. By the time I was four, they had gotten a divorce. And I grew up in a neighborhood that had a lot of gun violence. There was a lot of poverty. And I experienced some traumatic shit at a very young age. And I didn't know until I was in my 30s that I had PTSD. It was something that I had developed coping mechanisms for, right? And so one way that I would dealt with my PTSD was through dissociation. I was a straight A student. Mm. I was really good at school. However, cada rato, I would have inflammation throughout my body. And um, when I was 16, it caused me to be in a wheelchair. At like 18, I was also like in and out of a wheelchair because of the inflammation in my body. Doctors weren't really sure what was going on. They thought like I had like different autoimmune issues. Anytime I went to the doctor, I was always told I had a different autoimmune issue. And in 2019, uh, it got so bad that I had to be put on medical leave from my job as a teacher. By that time, I was a public school math teacher and I was put on medical leave and I had two kids already and I did not have any income coming in, which was very scary for me because I'd been working since I was 16 years old and I started reading some personal finance books and I created my first budget at 32 years old using the money that I was getting from my disability checks. And as I read personal finance books and I was like, wait a minute, I think I could build wealth. I think I could retire early. I think I could learn how to invest. And all of this was when I was sick. I was sick on medical leave um, for six months And as soon as I learned that information, I just became very passionate about teaching everyone else about that too. And so I started Wealth Para Todos, where I would share all the information I was learning. And poco a poco, people started reaching out to me to create their personal finance curriculums, to coach them. And now, you know, now I have my one-on-one coaching business along with my Wealth Para Todos Academy. That is amazing. Wow. You know, um, a lot of the folks that listen to this podcast are first-gen students. The good portion of them are children of immigrants. Uh, They are high-achieving students. And some of us, myself included, um, have chronic illnesses. And so when you talk about inflammation in your body, autoimmune diseases, I think that uh, multiple people are going to resonate with that story. But then when you 
took that to the to I was like we're we're going on this trajectory and you're telling your story and then you you go into I started learning about personal finance and wealth building I'm like wait what <laughs> that's not everybody's trajectory <laughs> and so um that the the topic that you're here to talk about today is actually very multi-layered just like your background and your experience so the the title is not the title that I came up with. It's your title of like self-caring yourself to financial independence. I think that's very, very specific and also uh almost kind of like surprising. Like, wait, you don't think about self-care when you think about financial independence and why the focus on the two? So can we get started by maybe you telling us uh how you are uh defining or interpreting these terms, like when you think about self-care. What are you referring to? And when you're talking about financial independence, what does that mean for folks who may have very little um, information on personal finance and financial literacy? Yeah, for sure. So my whole journey was that I didn't believe that somebody with my background could actually build wealth. For me, I felt so successful going to college and having a job that allowed me to eat at restaurants because I didn't have that growing up as a kid. I thought I made it. I did. I was not thinking about retirement. I wasn't thinking about financial security. I think the one thing that was in my mind was like, oh, oh think okay, comprar una casa, because that was mm-hmm. something that people, you know, kind of talked about. But I didn't necessarily even know how to do that or knew how to save purposely for it. And as I read these personal finance books, I didn't feel seen. I didn't feel like I could relate. And a lot of times, the ideas that I had in my mind were like, yeah. But you know what? Like, you don't have health issues. Like, I'm sick yeah. and I have two kids and I live in a high cost living area mm-hmm. and I have to pay for a lot of co pays in doctor fees. And I, you know, have to see a therapist. And later on, as I accepted my diagnosis of PTSD, then I was like, really, like, you know, I'm. I'm not healthy. Like I'm not healthy physically with this inflammation with, I got diagnosed with IBS. I had all these different health issues, but then also I'm somebody who with my PTSD wakes up in the middle of the night with my jaw clenched, Mm. screaming, heart palpitations. And that's also not something people talk about. People don't talk about that. So for me, I was like, how does someone like me build wealth? And it meant that I had to engage in a lot of self-care which was also very foreign for me because I grew up with, you know, family members who like they work until they die and they don't necessarily pause. I mean, I think one thing that I always remember hearing growing up was para de llorar, ponte a trabajar. This idea of just staying busy and productive was something that was so honorable. And so when all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to therapy. First of all, that's not something that my family was all like happy or accepting about or something that I even felt comfortable sharing. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, and I'm going to work with the healer who was helping me with my body, like with the massage work and energy work. But even like thinking that I was worthy enough to pay for that type of service felt very foreign to me. It felt very um, like a luxury. Mm-hmm. In so many ways, self-care for me felt like a luxury. It didn't feel like a birthright. It didn't feel necessary. And that was part of my issue, right? The fact that I wasn't, you know, engaging in consistent self-care, that I didn't find myself worthy of wellness, that impacted me. You know, it was easier for me to dissociate. It was easier for me to people please. It was easier for me to focus on helping everyone else, whether it be as a teacher, as a parent of two kids, as someone who's in a marriage, as a grandchild or a child of, you know, my, like so many people, there's so many people that I could always help and that it was easier for me to focus on helping everyone else instead of understanding where I needed support and where I needed help. And so my journey to financial independence really started with me learning to become wealthy, like W-E-L-L-T-H-Y. It started there. It started there. And as I started working one-on-one with clients, I realized, oh, this is not a you issue. This is, you know, systemically, a lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people, you know, in a capitalist society that prides itself in productivity, 
that makes resting a luxury, a lot of people don't necessarily know what it feels like for their nervous system to be dysregulated, for them to know that they're tired, that they're exhausted, that their body is signaling to them like, hey, I'm starting to get sick. You know, we're taught to push through. And one thing I learned and I decided was I was going to stop pushing through and instead pause to self-care. So self-care to me really represents like understanding in your body what it feels like to be dysregulated, understanding when you're out of alignment, any time that you do not think that you are capable, powerful, or deserving of something, you're out of alignment and understanding like what are the beliefs and the narratives that you have there? What are the things that are impacting your wellness and how you show up for yourself on a daily consistent basis? And then if, I mean, if you learn how to take care of yourself, then becoming rich is very easy, <laughs> but that's the hard part. The very, very hard part is unlearning everything that has told you that you weren't capable, deserving, powerful enough to do something. Then the financial independence is just making sure that you have a certain amount of money. Usually it's whatever your expenses are at retirement. So your annual living expenses times 25, that amount of money invested, it may be in the stock market or just knowing that you have that amount of cash flow available to you so that you can live off of it at a 4% withdrawal rate. Now that's a little fancy, but the financial independence is just knowing that you don't have to work because you have enough money to, to support yourself. And I believe you can't get to that place as a Black Indigenous person of color, woman, person in the LGBTQ plus community, if you do not engage in your healing first, which requires lots of self-care. You just unpacked so much in that answer. <laughs> I feel like the folks that, that are new to financial independence are like, wait, 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 hold up, hold up, times 25 and then what? <laughs> And then when you mentally do the math, like even if you're not making a lot of money, when you multiply that annually by 25, it's it feels like an inconceivable number. And um it's uh I don't hear this a lot. I I am a big fan of like different um personal finance folks and I and I follow a lot of other women of color who talk about personal finance. But I haven't heard anybody really focus on the self-care aspect of it, the way that you do and making that connection. And I, I do think it's important for, for folks, like you said, BIPOC, women, LGBTQ plus folks. Um, can you say a little bit more about like, because those are very specific populations and you just talked about the struggles, the systemic struggles with like focusing on self-care and wellness and even thinking about wealth as starting with your wellness. Um, so why is it so critical that for you to focus on this population, on BIPOC, women, LGBTQ plus folks? Well, because I'm that population. That's me. That's my friend. That's my cousin. That's my community. And I didn't grow up in a community where I saw people have financial security. So for me, it's like, well, let's figure it out. What does it look like for us to build wealth? What are all the challenges that we have to overcome? Now, historically here in the United States and, and even worldwide, right? Like the stock market, investing in the stock market is a very USA thing to do. Yeah. In other countries, even trusting a bank can be very foreign, can be very nerve wracking yeah. because- banks in other countries collapse, right? So here in the United States, part of building our, our financial security, the ability to retire is linked to the stock market. And yet we don't receive education a lot of times. I mean, I didn't. I got a master's from NYU and no one taught me how to, you know, invest in the stock market, how to make sure to, you know, the difference between a target date fund and low index funds and, understanding how much I should be investing on a monthly basis to retire at the age that I wanted to. No one, nobody taught me that. And the more I talk to people, I know nobody taught other people that too. A lot of times you only know what your inner circle has taught you, right? So yeah. if you are an immigrant or you're a child of immigrants and your family is new to this 
entire country learning a new language, also learning, you know, the, the financial systems, right, that may or may not even give you access because maybe you don't have a social security number. Maybe not every bank allows you to have an ITIN, you know, there are so many systemic things that impact people. And then we also know, like, the ability to open up a spousal IRA, well, that's only you know, available to people whose marriages were recognized by the federal government. And that's not something that was available to everybody. So that impacts the queer community or even like credit cards and the ability to build your credit history. Let's say your family has been here for a few generations, but, you know, it's likely that your mother didn't have access to a credit card until the 1970s yeah. and be able to buy a house on her own. So this, there's a lot of systemic things that impact people. And I think, unfortunately, we're not even taught about that. We don't know about the history of all the systemic forms of oppression. So a lot of times we think, oh, I'm not good at money. My family's not good at money versus my family has had to be really resilient and has already mm -hmm. overcome so much and still has to overcome so much to build financial security. So that's why I talk about that. <laughs> it can uh, feel really heavy too, like a big load on your shoulders to be part of that, you know, uh, first generation. So they first generation in college, but then first generation wealth building, um, because uh, you're already facing so many systemic issues. And then on top of that, let's say you take it upon yourself to learn about it and to start building wealth. Like I said earlier, just it feels like it's it's a lot, almost inconceivable. And so you mentioned that before you can even start to work on the wealth building, you have to work on yourself. And I'm wondering, like, what does that actually look like? Like, how do you actually do that? How do you actually self-care yourself to financial independence? Like, what are some examples? I know we all take care of ourselves differently. And financial independence looks differently based on everybody's, you know, cost of living and lifestyle, et cetera. But, um, you know, what, what does it look like for you? Or, or what are some examples you would want to share about, like, what that might look like for someone? Yeah. So first, I think the number one thing is like, do you take the time to be in your body? Can you notice the emotions in your body where they lie? So if you're feeling anxiety, do you feel it in your upper, in, in your chest? Do you feel it in your stomach? Do you feel it closing up in your throat? When you're uncomfortable and do you also feel, do you also notice neutral emotions and what it feels like to be feeling neutral or even pleasurable emotions? Do you know what that feels like in your body? And when you have whatever sensation, do you notice it? Can you pause? And can you provide yourself with some comfort? So if you're feeling overwhelmed and anxiety and you feel that in your body, do you take some time to then journal out your thoughts? Because our circumstances, we cannot control, but we're always going to have thoughts about those circumstances. And our thoughts are going to impact our feelings and our feelings impact our, our actions and our actions impact our results. So for me, a big part of my self-care routine is journaling and creating very intentional thoughts without gaslighting myself, right? Without saying like, oh, just, just be positive or just be happy or you can do it. It's more like, oh, you know what? I'm noticing this overwhelm in my body. Let me take some deep breaths. Let me regulate my breathing. Let me go for a walk. Let me take a little break from this situation. And then let me spend some time understanding what are my thoughts? What am I saying about this about this certain circumstance? What pressures am I putting on myself? How am I talking to myself as a result of actions that I've taken? Can I feel shame and disappointment and remorse without criticizing myself and judging myself and being mean to myself? Can I feel those uncomfortable emotions and shower myself with all types of cariño? That's real self-care. I mean, I used to, in my twenties, I used to think it meant getting my nails done, getting a blowout, <laughs> and, um, you know, getting a massage. And I was doing all of those things while being very self-critical to myself, mm. not being my number one ally, being, not being my number one best friend. And this, this happens to a lot. This happens to a lot of people where, you know, one of the things that like in order to reach financial independence, it's simple. 
all you have to do is, you know, become debt free, build an emergency fund, and then invest 25 times your annual expenses. Have that invested. That 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 in theory is simple. But what gets in the way of that is your the amount of extra cash flow that you have. Well, what impacts your extra cash flow? Your your income, right? And increasing your income. I truly, truly believe that we all have skills that we can monetize, but people start to have certain beliefs about themselves. And it could be not only, you know, from beliefs that they've created for themselves, but also what people have told them to believe about themselves. The lack of representation in certain areas is enough for people to think like, oh, I shouldn't apply for that higher income job. I don't see anybody who looks like me in that role. Are people even going to listen to me? You know, those things can impact you. But if you choose to engage in intentional thinking, if you choose to like notice those thoughts and be like, hmm, you know what, if I keep saying those thoughts to myself, it isn't aligned with the actions that lead to the financial results that I want. I'm pausing because I don't know if you could hear the, the no. garter. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we can't hear it. No. <laughs> okay. Um, let me pause again so then I can. So. I don't remember what I was saying. Well, one of the things that I um, heard in the way that you are defining and providing examples of self-care is uh, like a, it's a two-part process. It's doing the thought work of reframing your thoughts because a lot of us have limiting beliefs or just a lot of things that get a lot of not so helpful thoughts that get in the way of us meeting our goals. But then aside from that, there's also, because a lot of folks are like, ah, thought work, like it's, you know, they don't take it seriously. Um, and that's why a lot of folks don't take coaches seriously because they're like, ah, well, you know, that's not going to do anything. Um, they probably haven't done thought work <laughs> effectively. But the other thing you said that was super important, and, or at least it got to me, is the self-regulating piece too. Because if you've got trauma in your body, as someone who has experienced trauma, and uh, a lot of moments of like dysregulation in my body. Um, it's that too of like, take care of yourself by going on a walk, by journaling, taking a hot bath, like doing the things that are going to calm down your nervous system. That is also key because when you, like you said, you when you are well, then you are able to gain the clarity to pursue your long-term goals. And if you, one of your long-term goals is to, achieve financial independence and work when you want to, not because you have to, and it makes sense. Yeah, I feel like it's all kind of coming together. <laughs> yeah, and it's about the enjoying the journey too, right? Like at the end of the day, like you can have all the money, but if you're still being nasty to yourself, if you're still being so self-critical and judgmental, and anytime that you do experience shame, you just really like beat yourself down. Like who cares? Who cares? I mean, like that's not a way to live either. Right. And so part of what I've learned for myself in my journey to building wealth has been going to individual therapy, going to couples therapy, really learning and being intentional about all the healing that I feel like I had to do on an individual level, but also, you know, for my children, uh, understanding my communication and how my communication interferes and creates problems in my life. And when you do work on that, like for me getting, you know, doing EMDR for my PTSD, when I face that, which is the scariest stuff in my life, right? It obviously gives me nightmares at night. Sometimes it'll give me flashbacks during the day. Yeah. When I finally was like, okay, I'm going to heal from this poco a poco. I'm going to create space in my life to deal with this instead of just always avoid it. Man, it becomes so fucking easy to like tell people, hey, do you want to work with me when I'm one? <laughs> it becomes very easy <laughs> to just, you know, to start to invest more, to think about increasing your income because- there's other stuff that's harder. What's ha the hardest, hardest is to heal, to heal from, from our trauma. And that's also one of our biggest challenges. And I think people don't talk about healing. People talk about coping through yeah. drinking, through going to parties, through avoidance, through, you know, Netflix. I think a lot of times, like some of the coping mechanisms that I had is I was a workaholic and here in the yeah. United States, nobody was going to say, Hey, you have an issue. Instead, I was getting awards for teacher of the year and so many, so much praise. When in reality, if I had been drinking as much as I was working, it would have been a real big problem. And I just, you know, I struggled in silence. 
until my body literally would shut down every few months. Yeah. Not every few months, every few years. <laughs> Workaholism is so real. Dissociation is also very real. And a lot of listeners are going to relate to that because they're in the thick of it in their own um, educational and professional journeys. And it's really hard to break out of it unless you have a moment of pause or unless your body forces you to put a pause on things. So, I mean, in, in when you shared a little bit more about your background and you shared about having that time, the, um, the time that you were on um, the disability leave at work, you had that a little bit of like time and space and that pause, that moment to rest and reflect and learn about so much. And so like, I guess right now I'm thinking, uh, what do you wish other other folks knew or made time and space to, to kind of learn more about aside from their healing or like, what kind of advice would you give to folks who are in the thick of it, who are in the workaholism, who are doing the the nine to five or the working 24 uh, seven? Because again, like I said, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to see something when it's r- staring at you right in, in front of your face versus when you have some distance from it. So like for me, I, I live in Portugal right now. And so for me, it's so easy to like, critique the U.S. from an outsider's perspective because I am no longer there right now. Um, and when I move back, because we are planning to move back, I'm going to see it from a different perspective, having had that distance. And so, yeah, like what what do we say to folks who, who are not at a distance yet, who want, who see kind of like, oh, there's, there's, this is interesting. I'm intrigued. I might want to pursue this. It's new, but I'm like, I'm so busy. <laughs> yeah. I feel like all I can do is share my story. Yeah. And all I can say, is like, look, I went from working 12 hour days as a teacher to working also on Sundays to prepare for, for the week. I wasn't even making good money. My last year of teaching, I think I was making $60,000, but I was working out of habit, mm. out of coping mechanism out of not understanding how beautiful work boundaries could be in terms of creating like a beautiful life. I was addicted to people pleasing and serving other people because I was running away from my own, my, my PTSD. And I think if you're struggling with, you know, being a workaholic, a lot of times you don't even know, you don't even know that you're a workaholic. Right. And so I can just share, like, I was a workaholic. I didn't know I was a workaholic. I would get sick every once in a while. And I would just be like, oh, it's because I have autoimmune issues, not necessarily mm. knowing that, oh, I could actually become healthy, that I is also, it's possible to, you know, lower the levels of cortisol running through my body that was impacting the inflammation that was impacting my organs that would impact my health. I didn't know that that was possible because if I went to the doctors, the doctors were just very quick to just say, Hey, you have an autoimmune disorder. No one was looking at like a holistic way to really help me, you know, heal. And so I could say that that was my life. And then I got really sick. And I'm telling you, like I was in hospitals, like every few years, I had horrible health issues, horrible, horrible health issues. And then I got sick decided to pay off my debt because if I paid off my debt, I would, I told myself, well, then maybe I don't have to go back to teaching. Right. Part of it was like, Oh, I got to finish my number of years of teaching. So all my student loans could get canceled. Mm -hmm. Now, what if I just paid off my student loan cancels? And then if I had a choice, what would that look like? What would I do with my life? And unfortunately Mm -hmm. It still meant that I was addicted to working and I found myself being really busy. I was a stay-at-home parent and creating the longest to-do list, to-do list ever, putting all these expectations on myself, still causing myself to be really tired because the underlying issue was that I didn't find myself worthy of rest. I didn't know who I was without producing. And so if you don't, if you can't separate your identity from what you do for other people, you're going to really struggle me. Mm -hmm. You're going to struggle. I know that was my struggle. And as soon as I started to do a little bit more work, it started to like, for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to pay this $100 once a month to see this healer. And I started to feel better. 
and poco a poco, I mean, this happened so slowly for me. It, it, it meant like thinking, okay, well, what else can I pay for? How else can I invest in the support that I need to heal? So starting to go to individual therapy, couples therapy, uh, reading certain books, paying to be in spaces where other people were talking about like meditation, where it was cool to be healthy, not cool to be like stressed out and burnt out because that, those were the spaces that I was in, in the past. Mm -hmm. And now I have this life, you know, where I have a business that has six figures of revenue. I'm growing into multiple six figures of re revenue and I work 24 hours a week. And when I'm not working, I'm in Pilates and I'm, I'm still going to therapy. I am journaling. I'm sitting in the sun, reading my books. I'm going on walks. I'm taking my kids to school. I'm picking them up from school. I am just taking baths. You know, I spent a lot of time taking like these hot baths and I'm just like, my life really, really transformed. And I just want other people to know that's possible for you too. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That, um, that was really powerful. Um, and centering your story in, um, the words of advice for folks and, uh, just reminding them that there are other possibilities and, also, uh, another thing that you said that I thought that was really, really key is finding a way to separate who you are from what you do uh, and from the work that you do that we know the the work that we do so much work, you know, but we are more than our productivity. And, you know, even just getting to that, like, who am I outside of what I do every day or nine to five or 24 seven? That's a big question. That should be a journaling question for everybody. <laughs> if that's your homework for today is ask yourself, who am I outside of the work that I do? Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you have any other like closing words or just words of advice or things that you want to share, uh, maybe things that you wish that you knew. Um, what do you want to leave the folks today with when it comes to, because it's, it's, it's really powerful and you make it seem so easy and in some ways it is <laughs> but in other ways it's like oh yeah like it's you know the the equation to become financially independent isn't that hard and if you believe in yourself enough it it's not as hard to make you know six figures or whatever income you want to make so but the hard hard part is working on yourself that is so hard <laughs> so what how do you want to yeah, it doesn't yeah. end. Yeah. I want everyone here to know that they're safe to feel it all and think about it all. And when you feel unsafe, I want you to really ground yourself. I want you to become an expert at regulating your nervous system. Because once you regulate your nervous system, then you can engage in the thought work. And once you get, you're consistently engaged in the thought work, you're going to have clarity and you're going to be able to dream. And your the ideas of ways to make more money so that you can eliminate your debt, build an emergency fund, cash flow traveling, and anything else that you're really interested in doing, have enough money to max out an employer retirement account or a Roth IRA, like that is going to be accessible to you. But it really does start with acknowledging where you need support and where you, where you're struggling. If your nervous system is always dysregulated and then you just choose to engage in dissociation, you come home and you choose um, to drink, or you come home and you choose to turn on the TV, or you don't come home. You decide to go out and keep partying mm -hmm. at all that dissociation is keeping you from your healing. And I want you to know that you're safe. You're safe to feel it all and you're safe to think about it all. And once you create that safety for yourself, then building wealth is as easy as subscribing to my weekly newsletter, you know, and <laughs> just looking about the tips that I give in there or, you know, joining, you know, Wealth Para Todos Academy or working with me one-on-one -on -one, or watching YouTube videos and listening to like other podcasts. It becomes like, oh, I'll just do this. I'll just do that. And it's, that decision and that clarity is just always available to you when your nervous system is regulated. I am literally mm. like, I, it's so interesting. I wake up every morning, I drink my water, kind of check in with my body. And sometimes 
I feel this nervousness, especially if I've had like my PTSD nightmares mm-hmm. at night. And I'm just like, okay, let's just ground ourselves, create safety for ourselves, journal. Let me always take care of me. And then I have the clarity to take the actions that are necessary that are aligned with the financial results that I want. It literally can be that simple, but it's also never ends. That work never ends. The version of myself that was working on how to pay off debt versus the version of myself that was building an emergency fund or now that's like trying to grow to multiple six-figure company, each version had had moments where my nervous system was dysregulated. Mm. And each time I chose to pause instead of push through. So everyone here, I hope that you also choose to stop pushing through, pause, to engage in self-care and learn about how to max out your Roth IRA. Start there. I also really appreciate um, that you are normalizing starting where you're at, you know, that that you, when you said, like, I got started learning about how to create a budget when I was in my thirties, instead of, you know, what, a lot of, there's a lot of content out there about like, blah, blah, blah. Like I started in my twenties and I retired early, but I was 30. And then the rest of us are like, well, <laughs> I guess I'm going to give up. That's too late for me. <laughs> and, I mean, my, my husband didn't start investing at all, at all until he was 32 years old. And now he has a six figure investment portfolio That's in three great. years. That's amazing. How was that possible? Because he tripled his income. How was that possible? He believed in himself. How did he believe in himself? Well, like in in my husband, I mean, he grew up in the projects in the South Bronx, right? He, He didn't graduate from college, right? But part of it was just really creating this safety for ourselves that instead of spending our intention, thinking about everything that could go wrong, all the why nots, we started directing our energy and our time to what if it could work out? What would that look like? And, and operating in, you know, almost faith, but it was only possible because we had regulated nervous systems. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, you you know the way that you say it, it 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 makes so much sense, and yet, not a lot of us are receiving this message. You know, so I want to thank you for joining us today, for sharing about your story, for folks who resonate, who want to hear more from you. How can they reach you? Yes, please, please follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn. On Instagram at Wealth Para Todos. You can go to my website, www.wealthparatodos.com, subscribe to my weekly newsletter, and listen to my podcast, which is also called Wealth Para Todos. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. We're going to add all of the links, including the podcast link, to the show notes. Um, I'm so excited for you. I, you've done so much. I um, appreciate everything that you've shared on your social media content. I have followed your work for a while now and I you know I wasn't sure if you were going to say yes I decided let me just go ahead and reach out and see what happens and I'm so glad I did because you provided a wealth of information (laughs) so um, thank you for being you and for like being open and honest about your identity about who you are because a lot of folks are going to resonate with some or all aspects of what you shared today myself included um so I want to thank you again um it means a lot and I think that this is going to change some lives this is going to be plant that seed in a lot of you know people's you know minds and and hopefully you know everybody can can take something from it and start to to work on their healing and their wealth building in their own way. Gracias. We can do it. It's just going to be poco a poco. But, right. You know, continue to mm-hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, here are three ways you can support the show. The first is to make sure you're subscribed and leave a review of the podcast. If you leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, you become eligible for a free half-hour coaching session with me. Yes, that's right, one free session. Once you leave a review, you can email me a screenshot and I'll send you a link to sign up. 
The second way to show your love is to get yourself a copy of my free 15-page grad school fam touring kit, which includes resources on research, organization, grad school, and career prep. Go to gradschoolfemtouring.com slash kit to get it today. The third and last way to support my show is to follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok with the handle at gradschoolfemtouring. Thanks again and until next time.